Hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Rowe, and I'm the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Specialist at the Global Institute for Water Security and Global Water Futures here at the University of Saskatchewan. Welcome to today's Women Plus Water Lecture on Civil Society Action for a Sustainable Water Future. I'm just going to begin quickly with a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, you're able to listen in French by clicking on the globe-shaped interpretation button on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Today's event will be approximately one hour and all participants will remain muted throughout the event. Uh, however, there is an opportunity to ask questions at the end. And if you would like to ask questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A throughout the event. Closed captioning in English is also available by clicking on the CC button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We are recording in both languages and we will make these uh, videos available uh, after the event. The last 10 minutes, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. Uh, and so please take the opportunity to pose some questions to our uh, guests that we're inviting today. I would just like to um, hand this over now to my colleague, Corin Schuster Wallace, who will begin with some opening remarks. Thanks, Andrea, and hello, everybody. It's uh, a very warm welcome to the final Women Plus Water Lecture for 2023. I believe how fast the clip has gone and yet uh, I don't know where you are but where I am there's still some on the ground. So as Andrea said I'm Corinne Schuster Wallace, I'm a water health researcher, I am associate director of Global Water Futures and creator of the Women Plus Water community and on behalf of Andrea, myself, Stacey Domanski and everyone else who works tirelessly behind the scenes to bring these webinars to fruition. I really want to thank all of you for your support of and commitment to the Women Plus Water community. I really do believe that together we're growing and uh, we're making a difference. So I want to begin by acknowledging that we participate today from traditional territories of First Peoples across the country. I'm traveling today and I'm joining you from Treaty 3 territory and specifically from or Lake of the Woods, as many of you would know it. Those of us in Saskatoon are gathering on Treaty 6 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis. The University of Saskatchewan is committed to honoring and supporting the Indigenous peoples, Indigenous cultures, Indigenous values, and Indigenous languages that belong to the land. Water is the lifeblood of people and societies, and it connects us. And so, we pray our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of the Saskatoon region and reaffirm our relationships with one another and with the land and waters that are essential to our health and well-being, both in Saskatoon, but all over the country, Turtle Island. And so I invite those of you joining from other territories today to reflect on and to recognize the lands and waters that you call home and to set an intention to have a productive and positive discussion today. Today's topic is about civil society action for a sustainable water future. And so it's the perfect way to close this season because we know that creating a healthy future where water is valued and protected takes a community and is a community effort. Our guests today have taken action in important ways to challenge existing ways of thinking about water and using traditional knowledge to encourage greater stewardship of water for current and future generations. And so for further introductions, I'll pass back to Andrea. Thanks. Thank you, Corin. I'm delighted to provide brief introductions of our hosts and guests today. Um, as they are brief introductions, I encourage you to visit our website to check out each of their full biographies and learn more about them and their work. Our host for today is Dr. Louise Arnell. Louise uh, is a research associate with Global Water Futures at, at, the, at the University of Saskatchewan in Canmore. Her research focuses on advancing the science and practice of probabilistic hydrological forecasting. Uh, as an artist and scientist, Louise aims to further science engagement through the fusion of science and art. She is the lead curator of the Virtual Water Gallery Art Sciences Project. Welcome, Louise, and thank you for hosting today. 
Thank you so much, Andrea. Our guests, Anita Collins and Priscilla Samard. Uh, as Anishinaabe, Quay, and members of the Treaty Number no. 3 Women's Council, uh, Anita and Priscilla uh, join their colleagues, Isabel White, uh, Maggie Patequin, Rhonda Fisher, and, 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 uh, and Anita Collins are representatives from the four directional governance. The Women's Council worked together uh, with Territorial Planning Unit and Decolonizing Water. Uh, welcome, Anita and Priscilla, and we're really looking forward to learning more about your work uh, as with the Treaty Number no. 3 Women's Council. Thank our you. next guest, <laughs> thank you, thank you, we're looking forward. And our and our next guest, Haley uh, Kroilik. Haley was born and raised in Kenora, Ontario in Treaty Number no. 3. She studied political economy at the University of Manitoba and community development at Trent University. Haley now works at the Ground Council Treaty Number no. 3 as a policy analyst, focused on implementing Anishinaabe in a Quinn through policy. She has worked on developing a Manitou Aki in a Quinn toolkit, which she, which she shares the key principles that guide us in decision-making in the Treaty 3 territory, helps to further our understanding of our responsibilities to the land and provides uh, guidance for government community leadership and proponents upon entering the Treaty 3 territory. Uh, welcome, Haley. Thank you for joining us. Great to meet you. Hello. Thank you so much. And finally, our uh, last guest is Mikasa Looking Horse. Mikasa Looking Horse is born in the Six Nations territory as Mohawk and Lakota. She is a youth leader of Oneganos uh, Global Water Futures Research Project for five years and has co-created and host of the live stream podcast called Oneganos Let's Talk Water. Uh, Oneganos Let's Talk Water uh, recently won uh, the David Suzuki People's Choice Award. And Mikasa's work advocating for clean water has been featured at the United Nations and numerous media outlets. She completed the Six Nations Traditional Medicine Practitioners course and is a student uh, in Indigenous Studies at McMaster University. Well, welcome and uh, thank you so much to our hosts and guests for joining us today. And I'm going to hand this uh, conversation over to you, uh, Louise, now. And uh, each one of you can take some, some time to present your work, I think. Uh, I'll leave it to you, to Louise, to invite invite some of your fellow guests. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, should I, sorry, the small question, should I start now or did we want to start with a small feast before, or an introduction of a feast? Yeah, we can start that. Um, my lady is just showed up here too, so I'll give her to introduce herself. Sounds great. You're on. I <laughs> I'm still I'm still cold and chilled from uh, being down on the um, water. Uh, what was your name? Uh, Chia Chia Norquadok Quaid. Um, Indigo. Um. Was that when Ewa beaten and in a cause in? I think we might be having some connection issues. Yeah, it seems that way. Oh. Just, um, we want to continue until they can reconnect. Okay, sounds good. Should I start with my introduction? Then I'm happy to do that. Yeah, that sounds great. Perfect. Okay. Um, I prepared a couple of slides or a few slides. So let me just uh, share my screen if that's okay. All right. Um, let me know if you can see this, but I trust you can all see that. Um. I wanted to briefly introduce myself and, and my work uh, and talk about the art, water, and climate connection and my passion for water through an artistic but also a scientific lens. 
So I'm a scientist with a lifelong love of art. I was uh, born in a family of artists, but then when I had to decide what to study, I went for the sciences and specifically water sciences. Um, I was born and uh, raised near many different rivers, but the ones that I wanted to highlight are the Seine River in France, near which I was born, and then the one that I'm lucky to live uh, nearby now, the Bo River. So a little bit about uh, arts and sciences and uh, the fact that art can be a catalyst in the co-creation of new knowledge to benefit society as a whole. Until the 17th century, actually, art was used to refer to a skill or a mastery, and it wasn't really differentiated from science the way that it is today. Nowadays, when you go to school, you have to choose uh, what classes you want to take, and classes of arts and of sciences are clearly distinguished. But this apparent dissimilarity hides a fruitful complementarity, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. Before the 19th century, actually, meteorologists thought that each cloud was uh, unique in every kind of way. But then Luke Howard spent years studying and painting clouds above his house in London, and it led to the clouds classification that we use today. This is one of his beautiful watercolors here. The way that I discovered the merging science and arts is uh, I wanted to be able to communicate the science that I do to a wider audience than I was able to reach with the traditional means that scientists scientists use, for example, uh, the ones of papers and, and graphs and numbers or talks at scientific conferences. So I thought that art, something that was in me since I was born essentially, uh, could be a good way to do that. Um, and science aims to tackle societal needs, so it makes sense to be able to communicate science back to a wider public. And art can help make that science accessible to more people. So this is a piece that um, I created at the end of my PhD um, in, in sciences. And it's called Gambling, Gambling with Floods, uh, interrogation mark. And it, I created it in order to be able to communicate probabilities in forecasting river flows and things like that. I encourage you to check uh, my blog that I put a link to here if you want to know more. So I am also a scientist and this is a piece that I did with my mom. So she created these beautiful paintings while I was telling her what my science was about. And so what this shows you is um, I essentially try with this one, if you can see my mouse, to predict flows months and months in advance. And to do that, I use mathematical models and equations that describe the movement of water under our feet and in rivers. There are people who go up in the mountains to be able to take snow measurements, for example, in the winter. And then using this information, we can then infer how much water is going to melt out of the snow and going to rivers down in the valleys. But we can't know all of this uh, uh, with 100% certainty because there is chaos in nature, for example, uh, with the butterfly effect. But also, we, our data is not 100% accurate in our models either. So we can't predict things with 100% certainty. Sadly, I'm not the one up in the mountains taking those measurements. I look at the forecasts and create them behind my computer. And I then translate this output uh, for water users such as farmers for growing crops. I had to put a quick plot in there because I'm a scientist after all. Uh, these are forecasts for the Bow River at Banff, which I produced recently. The forecasts are in blue. It shows uh, an ensemble instead of one single value because, as I said, we can't be 100% sure. So we say it should be around that value. And this is for the Bow River at Banff between uh, June and September of every year. And you can see how well or not uh, as well that captures the actual observed values in the red. To add to um, the strength of using art and merging it with science, art is also a tool that can be used to connect. Uh, water is life and water related challenges affect everyone, not only scientists, right? So science and art can help open ongoing scientific discussions to a larger audience. It adds an emotional dimension to otherwise cold scientific facts. And art exhibitions and galleries provide a space for a diverse audience to meet and engage that would otherwise perhaps not meet. 
So to conclude, um, a few years ago when I joined Global Water Futures and the University of Saskatchewan, I launched and uh, I'm now the lead curator of the Virtual Water Gallery. It's an online science and art space that brings together artists, water experts, and the public to collectively reflect on water challenges that we all face. So there are eight beautiful projects as part of the Virtual Water Gallery that showcase water across various Canadian landscapes and they emerge from collaborations between artists and water experts from across Canada. If you want to explore these beautiful projects, I encourage you to check these websites here on the bottom. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. And I'll now leave the floor to uh, the other wonderful woman here with us today. Have Anita and Priscilla been able to connect again? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We got, we, I think we got the tip of the store because it's blowing like crazy over here. <laughs> oh, I don't know if that's going to do to our internet. <laughs> uh, is, it, is it our Kurt? Yeah, sure. Okay, so, um, Buju, uh, Lopski by Ingun, uh, Nebu Waikwe, uh, Chibongi. Um, my name is uh, Anita Collins, and I am from Seine River. <laughs> and um, I've been on the Women's Council for going on eight years now. This is my second trip on the, on the, on the Women's Council. Be able to turn on the camera. Camera is not on. There we are. <laughs> okay. We're kind of glitching out here, so I don't know if we're going to be on and off. So, look, oh, come on. And we just invited another lady from uh, the United States to join us. She can introduce herself real quick. Hi. Hi. Oh, uh, my name's Anna Baker. I'm from the U.S. Geological Survey. And I am super honored to be visiting here and participating in the, the water walk and Having the opportunity to work, to learn about how to honor the waters. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so this morning we um we did our uh, we did our ceremony. Um, there's there's stuff that we we can't do like we can't record the the ceremony while it's happening. I did manage to make a few pictures, uh, and I sent them to Haley. So I don't know if Haley can share the laughter. Uh, but when we Or no, do we lose them again? Yeah, seems like it. Oh, oh you had it. well, maybe I'll hop into the presentation and I'll give them a segue. Sounds great. Thank you, Haley. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Can everybody, well, let's see here, present. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Looks great. Um, so uh, my name is Haley Krolik. I'm a policy analyst um, at Grand Council of Treaty 3. So I work directly with um, Mona and Priscilla from the Women's Council. Um, maybe just let me know if you see them pop back in. Uh, so I work with them um, mostly um, just to learn and understand what uh, the relationship with women and the Anishinaabe and Treaty 3, what that relationship is with water. Uh, so you'll probably hear us as we're talking refer to water as Nibe. So that's the Anishinaabe Moen word for water. Um, so this, this is, uh, if it is Anita back? Okay, perfect. I'll pass it off to Anita. This is Anita's part here. So um, through our presentation, through our presentation today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, what that relationship to Nibet is in Treaty 3, uh, what that looks like. Um, and we're also going to talk about the Nibet Declaration and Manitouaki and Okanagawin, um, which are, which is the Great Earth Law. So that governs 
Um, that's basically a mechanism, an administrative tool for us to implement um, Anishinaabe and Nakanagawin, which also means law. And Nakanagawin, you'll hear us say lots too, that is the Anishinaabe Moen word for law. Um, so those are the two mechanisms we use to uh, protect and respect Mother Earth. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it uh, to Priscilla and Anita to talk about what that relationship um, looks like. As you, um, as you know, we, we got caught up when I started talking about the ceremony. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it not bad. Excellent. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> so, but um, when, when we started the uh, the the uh, the bed decoration, uh, it was uh, it was a real big concern this because uh. What, for me, anyway, when uh, I was listening to rap, the news and I was watching how bad the water is out by the uh, the oceans and stuff and all the dirt and everything and, and, and garbage in the waters, I was just, oh my gosh, that is not good. So then um, Grand Council got together, the elders in Europe of Germany 3, and they met at Black Bear to talk about Nabani and what needs to be done and how do we need to say our water so we we got it looks like they have cut again on my end oh no <clears throat> we're really getting hit with the bad storm here um okay so i'll keep going <laughs> sounds good thank you <laughs> so uh, Everything that I've been taught from elders uh, and the Women's Council is all focused about the Anishinaabe women's relationship with Nibe. So Anita and Priscilla speak to this so beautifully, but um, when they talk about water, like water is within us, water is all around us. We need water to live. Um, every animal needs water to live. All the plants, everything, there's water in the rocks. There's water absolutely everywhere. Uh, when women are pregnant, they carry the nibe inside of them. Um, and when, they, when we birth babies, that's the first thing that comes out is the, the nibe. Uh, so that's really, really key to that sacred relationship um, and why what Anita is talking about with the ceremony, that's why we do those ceremonies with water because we need to give our respects to nibe. We need to make sure that we're honoring that relationship and that we're giving or offerings. So uh, you heard Anita and Priscilla speak earlier to um, the fruit. So that's really key. So the fruit, so strawberries and blueberries, the strawberries represent our hearts. So whenever we do offerings, we always offer um, blueberries and strawberries um, to the water spirits uh, to give thanks back to Nibe for all the life that it brings. Um, another really, really amazing thing that's going on in Treaty 3 is uh, the Anishinaabe midwives. So we're starting to get back to um, having doulas who follow the Anishinaabe protocols. So the doulas know all of those uh, protocols that are inherent to uh, Anishinaabe Kwe. So they're able to um, Anita can speak to this a little bit better than I can. <laughs> well, I'm covering for her right now. Um, so Anita, will I'll pass that back to Anita uh, when they're able to hop back on. And then another really, really key and important thing um, that we always talk about is that relationship from youth and water. So making sure that um, as water carriers and water teachers uh, that we're passing on the knowledge about Nibe and passing that on to the youth. So having that uh, intergenerational knowledge transfer is something really, really uh, important to us in Treaty 3. Um, so you'll see here in these pictures, uh, that's Laura Horton, so that she is using her water drum. So that's part of sacred ceremony um, when we're honoring Nibe. And then at the bottom here, you'll see Anita um, and Cheyenne Kobanes. So you'll see... Oh, good. Good. So you'll, <laughs> you'll see here at the bottom, they're uh, taking part in a water ceremony over at Experimental Lakes. So 
the Women's Council um, in the and Grand Council Treaty Three, we have a good relationship with the Experimental Lakes uh, in uh, Treaty Three. So we have a relationship with them, and we make sure that uh, we always go there for water ceremony. Um, and maybe with that, I'll pass it to Priscilla and Anita. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I can you here. <laughs> We're just trying to do the shower thing here. All the owl senses you keep speak. So I had a boring to you. Oh, when you talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Chris, where did you leave off? Uh, maybe you can touch on the Anishinaabe doulas and the midwives. Correct. Right. Um, so when we, when we talk uh, about uh, the water and it comes to, to our ceremonies, um, we do a lot of, we're, 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 we want to get back into the uh, earth, uh, birthing water. We want to be able to have our babies in, in the water again. Uh, when our elders talk about how, um, how it was done way back when, uh, the kids weren't born in hospitals. They were born in the water, right? And uh, and that's where our teachings come from. Uh, one of our first teachings is the separation of the baby and mom when the umbilical cord is cut. And that's, that's another teaching. Uh, and there's teachings that go on when the mother is pregnant and the baby is in the water. There's teachings that go on for that. So there's a lot of teachings that, that uh, pertain to uh, to the water when it comes to Anishinaabe people. And it's not only us. Um, that, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are that want to take care of the water, that want um, that want to help us take care of the water. Um, and there's ceremonies that we do every every season. Um, our elders always talked about how important our tobacco is. And uh, always taught us that we were to put tobacco down or to put uh, tobacco in the water the beginning of each season before we before we use the water. So there's a lot of teachings that we follow, and wow, we're 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 passing them down to our youth. Uh, it's our youth now that are going to be taking out of those teachings and to carry it forward. So, but um. There's also, um, you, you have the good and the bad of, of, the, of, the, of the water. Um, if you don't take care of the water, right, the way that we're supposed to, uh, Mother, um, the Creator does, um, how do I say that? Um, where I love the waters for us, <laughs> if we're not taking it, if we're not doing it properly. Uh, my son uh, lost his dad to uh, the water. Wow. Um, they knew that they weren't supposed to be out on the lake when it's rough, and we all know that's one of our one of our most important teachings is you don't go on the water and it's rough. So, so there's different there's different there's different spirits that are that live in the water as well. You know, and when we did our uh, our water ceremony at Nestor Falls, uh, directed by the elders, um, we went into the we started our uh, our boat ride that morning, and we went to the middle of the lake, and then we started um, talking with Laura and um, what was her husband's name? Delbert. Delbert Horton, and Delbert started talking, and then uh, an eagle flew by us and, and as Anishinaabe people when you see an eagle you you know you're you're doing what you're doing is right um an eagle is one of our other teachings it's another teacher of our for us <laughs> so he uh he joined us and he sat there through the whole ceremony and every now and then he he did a little chirp or i don't know if he was saying something to us or if he was talking to us but it was in the way that I felt at the time, it was so peaceful. You know, we were doing right. We were doing good. And that eagle just came by just to let us know that we were doing good. And we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. So there's a lot of amazing stuff that happens when we're in this line of work. And when, you, when you're 
when you want to take care of something, right? It's everything just happens the way that it's supposed to happen. Um, this picture that you're looking at, uh, we're heading back out there on the 8th to do another ceremony. So it's going to be interesting. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. Oh my gosh. I, I, I liked it out there when I first went out there. But we're, we're, we're heading out there on the 8th as well. So uh, I'll pass it over to Priscilla. She has, uh, we were at the, we were at our, our, our water gathering this morning and she was talking about the, um, ah, what's the story? What story? And the story you were told in this morning. Oh, I was telling him a story about how, um, how water came and it, go, it goes way back to the creation story in the Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe teachings. And I'm talking Ojibwe teachings, old time teachings, but um, the um, uh, the uh, it goes back to uh, we were talking about the water bundle we make we we were making, and to make the water bundle we have uh, we use um, uh, red willow red willow sticks. They were they're about the size of your finger like that, and we make them taller though, and uh, so uh, we. We we take the red willow off, and we um, from the red real willow we um, keep that because that's part of medicine. The the red, but there's a story behind the red willow, and that the the red willow during during the day when the creator was make making the uh, creation, um, the uh, the uh, spirits came down to the earth as, as they were making creation. And in the creation making, nan, uh, Nanabush, nan, uh, some call him Nanabush, or some call say Nanabush. But uh, uh, Nanabush was out naming all the plants and animals. He was given that task. And uh, during that task, he uh, he was naming pretty well all the plants and animals and he came across every, every once in a while and he was running through the, the fields and through the uh, brush he would cut himself on some of the twigs and that and so when you look through when you look at the landscape and you see uh, a red willow stick cloven out of the grass that it's an indication of where Nana Bush was because the red, uh, the 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 red rep, uh, represents his his blood, as he was naming these animals and he was running around. Uh, so that that's how uh, that's why the the red 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 willow is used. It's a powerful bark, and the uh, medicine uh, the uh, when you shave the bark, the red comes off, and that that's what some uh, we sometimes make red willow tea or we make uh, tobacco things in it. So that's what I was talking about this morning, that there's more to, uh, there's teachings and now even in the bundle that we make, uh, the bundle we make is uh, we string together with sinew and we use uh, natural um, uh, plants from uh, like strawberries and blueberries uh, to, uh, to paint the red willow sticks. And in the red willow sticks, uh, well, once we painted that, then we uh, made uh, four different colored cloths. And through uh, uh, teachings uh, that were passed down and given to us by the Creator, they told us we had to add two more colors to that to that bundle. And one was uh, one was white to represent the women, and uh, and that was a woman's offer, and the um, uh, green one was to to be to a man who was in our in our group uh, who came to the gathering, and he was to 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 uh, put the green one out in uh, to, in uh, on the earth. So there were we talk about balance. We talk about balance between men and women. There's different roles and different responsibilities. But when it comes to water, water's, uh, water is depend. Uh, the land is dependent upon the water, and the, and vice versa. 
So we have a man and woman, we have to do those two offerings together. So that's what I was talking about this morning. But I wanted to also mention that in that whole development of the Nibbe De Declaration, it was a, a, a long process. It took us um, approximately four years to get that and get that going. And uh, basically, Nibbe is a set of principles under, on now that guide uh, a treatment and and respect for water. And uh, so what we did was we uh, did a number of consultations and we did uh, some engagement sessions at the First Nation level. In our territory, we have 28 First Nations. So we had four different uh, uh, regional work consultation levels. And then we had one major uh, uh, um, gathering in which all four, uh, uh, all 28 uh, bands came together and and talked uh, and heard, got feedback on, on what we presented. But it, uh, we had a core committee of, it was not only women, but we had youth, uh, we had um, uh, elders, and we had knowledge keepers all from the territory that were participating in it based on the direction given by the, by the elders uh, in February of uh, 2014. And uh, anyway, um, uh, we, uh, we, 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 we took all their feedback in these regional workshops and we, we got together as a committee and our, uh, and we, and like I said, we had our wizard owner women that was there was, uh, quite a bunch of people. And, uh, what we did was we, uh, were sitting there and the Obichita, um, was at one of our meetings and he was sitting there and he, uh, we came up with a whole number of themes. We also came up with the idea that we didn't want a great big long huge um, uh, law uh, declaration that would take days to read and things like that. So what we did was we wanted a one pager. So we took the key points out and um, and we uh, put them under themes. And then it was so Gichida that 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 um, drew a thunderbird. For some reason, the way we laid out the thirds, terms, uh, the themes, I mean, it uh, it uh, it came out like a thunderbird. So uh, we knew we were doing right on on what we were doing with the uh, with, with the declaration. So the final step for that was once we got that the the changes done to the to the final um, national gather, and then we went to the chiefs. So we had to bring it to our twenty eight chiefs. And uh, we made a presentation there, and uh, from from the presentation, there was unanimous support for our, our water declaration. And in this year, to 2023, as of December of 2022, we we sat with the territorial planning unit to develop a strategic plan to to uh, expand the the. Uh, the declaration and the Babe Declaration into a a law, and the Bay law, and, and the Indian word that we use for it, the Anishinaabe word we use for it is a uh, Nebe uh, and in uh, Akanagayan. So that uh, that that is what our next steps are in the future. We want to make make it into a law so that uh, it is enforceable. Some of the principles that we talk about are in, in, enforceable. But currently now it's just a reminder that uh, hey, listen, guys, get treat uh, 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 gonna treat the water a lot better than what you're doing. When you when you uh, think of development, what are you gonna do about the water? What are you gonna do to clean it up? And that's what the declaration does. It just that it serves as a remind a reminder, but it doesn't say you have to clean it up if you pollute it. And that's what the the, the law we hope would would uh, do that. And uh, so that's that's where we're at with the uh, Nibbe Declaration. In the meantime, what we did was we um, we set up a, a, a portal, a Nibbe portal. And in that Nibbe portal, we have um, we have um, a lot of. Uh, I, I like the, the way it's set up simply because it's like you're going on a canoe ride, <laughs> and in the canoe ride. You get all these little points, and in the points, it tell comes up with stories and explanations and things like that. 
So uh, uh, it starts off at the first page being the purpose of the of the, of the Nibe Declaration and gives an explanation of why we are doing this. And uh, in the second page, uh, it uh, it shows the uh, declaration itself. If you're not familiar with it, there it is there. And uh, then we have uh, four or five uh, different categories that we look at. One of them is song and story. And like today in our in our gathering, we had song and story. And uh, we, uh, we look at teaching the bay. And so what that means, teaching the bay, is it, that's about uh, uh, cr uh, curriculum development and lesson plans and things like that. Uh, our knowledge keepers have given us uh, uh, information about what is so, uh, what what we need to know about Nebe, and it's up to people to uh, if they want to go on site, uh, they can um, they can um, uh, to want to go on site they can access lesson plans for their classroom, for example, mm -hmm. and uh, things like that. Uh, the other themes were, uh, I th think we had Nebe in art, Nebe in, uh, 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 Nebe in its connection to the uh, Matatua Kiyanaka Nagewan. And uh, basically what it's saying is that Nebe is connected to everything, our grandmother, the mood. Uh, and when I say it, that balance is so important to be man or woman, sun, the moon, and the grand, grand, grandfather, grandmother. All these kinds of things uh, are are so important in in that connection. Uh, so uh, the uh, since we just did a uh, um, at a launch of the uh, debate, we're still in in the process of uh, of uh, incorporating local history, local stories about water, uh, local. Uh, because uh, in our territory, the waterways were were the only thing that was here before the highways and that. So there's history in that in those waterways, and we are in the process of gathering the, that information. And we're allowing people to put their uh, their stories online like that. Uh, why the water is so important, and uh, also <laughs> provide an opportunity for people to. Uh, uh, an opportunity for people to uh, uh, re uh, leave a place for their songs, like uh, to teach song uh, water songs, water uh, birthing songs, things like that. <clears throat> so uh, I know we just did uh, we just sang songs at the at the water when we put the water down in the rapids. It was so beautiful. You know, when you sing that song in the current and. Uh, the eagle comes along, and they, uh, it was already the mallard duck waiting for us there, <laughs> and uh, it's they seem to know they're they're getting an offspring. So these are the kinds of things that we we talk about, and uh, it was so important that the man be be with us today, and then we had a couple of men there. And despite the weather, we had a really good turnout, and uh, and we had our man put the. Uh, but uh, do the pipe ceremony with the lady, and so the men, male pipe was there as well. And we also had the uh, um, the male putting out uh, the green um, tie to the for the land, so that the tobacco offering was made. And then uh, once he did that on the ground, he put the tobacco, some of the tobacco on the ground, and then the rest he put on the branch, uh, tree branch. So that was uh, that was okay, but it, it's so important. People really feel connected to the land. They feel connected to the water when when ceremony. Or we can't explain enough how how, how important ceremony is. Mm -hmm. uh, anything to add? Um, yeah, there was a another thing that we want to do too is we want to take the uh, the Nibir Declaration and MAI to the uh, to the school level. We want to uh, implement that yeah. a, a lecture that the that the schools will will do. I guess I don't know what it's called. But 
work in them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So hopefully we'll build the chair mat into part of the curriculum for the schools in in our area. And, and that's part of uh, uh, one of the things and why, why we feel so strongly about the ceremonies, fall and spring ceremonies, is because just because I had the information, just because Anita has the information, it's not, it's not good enough just for the two of us. We have to spread that knowledge as far as we can, and we have to get as many women involved uh, so that there's a um, hundred bundles that are in different lakes as opposed to only in one lake or one river, you know? So our the whole intent is to educate educate people to do what what the creator had had uh, and uh, creator and that and our guardians um uh, uh, is so common want us to do so uh, uh I think that's so important uh teaching all the all, all women to uphold their responsibilities and knowing what their responsibility is first and then uphold and be good Another thing that we need to look at too is the climate, right? And how that is going to affect our, our, um, our ways down here. So there's, there's a lot of things that we look at when it comes to water. Um, we do ceremony, we educate, you know, we do walks, right? We take our, we take our papers to ceremony even, you know, the the bed declaration went to a ceremony, right? To see what, what we missed, if there's anything that we needed to add. If the if the the uh, uh, creator was okay with it, right? And there were some changes that we had to make, uh, and we made those changes. So I think um, we're good to go with um, implementing um, the Nevada Declaration with the schools, and the sooner the better, because um, our waters are uh, we're we're. We're getting more mines and we're getting more, um, like the nuclear waste project, right? They want to go and bury the ignis. Well, <laughs> kind of scary, but so like even those people, we want to teach them about the water as well, right? So when they're doing and they're working around the water, they know what to watch out for and they know how to respect the water. And they know that they're going to know that they need to put tobacco in the water before they do anything with it. Right. So, yeah. Uh, I wanted to try to speak more further on the MAI connection. And uh, for those that aren't familiar, uh, Treaty 3 has had a, a debate on, on the uh, Manitou of Kianuk and the game went for for many years, and what this is, it's a great earth club. Uh, and what, what they've done is in uh, years ago, and this I'm talking quite a few, 1997 was actually when the Nebe uh, and uh, Manitou and Aki and Akinagain was actually uh, 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 honored through ceremony and uh, brought to light. Well, that that is uh, that is important because the earth, uh, this this law puts the primacy of the of First Nations in control of the environment and in in, in control of the of the uh, of the um, water. So, what's in our territory? The fifty-five thousand square miles that is in Treaty Three territory. Not, uh, it kind of says that you can't do a development unless you consult First Nations, and that to me is one of the key things. Uh, and that that includes water, water because uh, we need water laws to protect them. Uh, but there's that connection between the two. One to work without the other, and. Um, I know in the law, El Manitou came up and again when this, this water is mentioned, but it's not to the degree that we want it to be. Uh, so what we want to see is the enforcement of, of well, I'm true um, uh, 
consent to development within our territory. And uh, so that's, that's why it's so important between the land, the resources that are within our land, uh, and all of this is based on traditional uh, land use and uh, uh, knowledge, so that um, uh, if you were developing in our territory, then first and foremost, you have to have this consent, and you have to also have a plan that would uh, uh, you clean up the clean up the I'm a, for lack of a better word the mess that you make when you uh, when, when you leave the, when you leave your development, for example, mining or uh, even clear cutting. Uh, if you're clear cutting the land, uh, put more trees back to grow. Uh, so I can't stress enough how how important the great law is because it's based on, on on respect. It's based on our rights as Aboriginal people. It's it uh, it's uh, mutual benefit, reciprocity. You take you you help us out, and we get some back. A responsibility uh, for development on the land. I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> we were at least was the top for ten minutes, and we've been talking for up an hour. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for sharing, though. This is all fantastic. Um, if if that's okay, uh, maybe we leave some ten minutes as well to to Makasa, and then we can have a bit of uh, conversations after, and we can still talk about a lot of these beautiful topics. Yeah, can I just can I just add one one last thing? Where oh, for to sure. find, yeah, just where to find the resources. So you can go to the Nibet portal that uh, the ladies were speaking about. Uh, the links there. You can also find the Nibet Declaration and then the Manitouakia Nakanagiwin Toolkit, which is all on uh, GCT3.ca. Thank you, Hey. <laughs> I think Stacey shared a lot of these as well. On oh, the... good. Thank you. Fantastic. Makasa, would you like to share a bit about who you are and, and what are and so on with us? Yeah, sure. And thank you, Anita, um, for all your words. And it can definitely relate a lot. Um, for, so I'm from um, Six Nations. So Sego, Sego, Makashi gets Penikahago, Niwago, Hanjoda, Wakatuhuni, Six Nations, Nido, Wageno. I'm from Six Nations, so we're located um, along the Grand River, and we have lots of creeks and an aquifer underneath us, just to place us. And I work for Oneganos Water Research Project that's funded by GWF, and I've been part of the project for the last five years. Um, I'm Mohawk and Lakota. Um, Dr. Don Martin Hill is um the leader or our project is indigenous knowledge led and co-created so we have tons of um tons of really it's uh really an innovative research water research project because it's indigenous knowledge led so we have our, our clan mothers and our chiefs and our community uh lead the project and we do whatever they they want and whatever we need in the community and uh carry it out and we have and it's let um it's partnered with like biologists chemical engineers or chemical biologists engineers um health professionals and um into this one project um and so we have a super cool project that we um that is really big and it has we we work with the community and with our like birthing center and um we have like a virtual reality uh digital mapping team on um, uh ecological grief a youth mental health app and um i forget I'm, i feel like i'm forgetting some things but um i'm going to share my screen here and so um I started working on the project five years ago and we found out that there was five different heavy metals within our tap water, within Six Nations tap water, and 
only 10% of our population is hooked up to the water treatment plant. And so Six Nations is water insecure. Well, let me see. I'm just trying to share my screen. And so the big problem to share screen. Apologies. Um, so a big problem that we have is that only 10% of the waters, uh, the, of the community is hooked up to the water treatment plant. And so there's a lot of families that have to pay for their water. Um, and it's a huge problem and we have a huge problem with infrastructure. And so my job was really for community engagement and going to schools and, um, I found out that Nestle was removing 3.6 million liters of our aquifer water. And so um, for the last few years, I've been fighting Nestle and we ha I secured a cease and desist uh, from um, our Haudenosaunee Confederacy and we gave that to Nestle. And then the following year, we uh, not the following year, but just maybe last year, I. Uh, we had to do another one for Blue Triton because they sold to Blue Triton. And um, and they said that they didn't hear a, a week after their permit was going their permit was going through. Um, they said there was no indigenous um, no messages for in, from any indigenous surrounding indigenous communities about the water. And so they were grant because nobody wrote on their website. And so um, they were um, granted another permit for the next seven years with no limitations of extraction. And so now we're uh, at a legal battle right now. But that's just a little bit of what how um, I worked within the uh, wa water research project. So my job was also to engage communities. Um, and so um, I was able to do like a webinar and that's all this was supposed to be was just a single webinar um and it ended up being a uh, 30 episode um oneganos let's talk water and so it was really amazing because i did not see this coming whatsoever it was just supposed to be a one-off thing but because of covid we weren't able to go i wasn't able to go within the communities and do big events like we usually would engaging youth and the community. So I uh, did this one webinar and one thing led to another. Um, and so each week, what each week um, I talked, I had to redo my whole living room and I put, um, put in some, the microphones and we got like a little produce one uh, paid job for a producer who which which was not really a producer she was just also uh, like a, a master's student uh, working on water but we ended up changing my mom's living room into a studio and we had um we had an episodes all focusing on water but everything is interconnected and relates to water. And so we had episodes on like uh, star star knowledge and uh, we each episode we have a grassroots uh, person, grassroots organization or a community. And then uh, we had a science minute. So we each episode we had a scientist, um, whether that was a chemical engineer or uh, biologists or Tina uh, or Nidhi Nagabalta, who's from the United Nations University, um, and we had different different um, themes. So it was really amazing. And maybe this will go. Can you hear? Can you hear that? Or 
Were you able to hear us video? Yeah, we can. Okay. So here's just a little snippet. I have a uh, Kwana chasing horse before she got super uh, famous on us. She talked about her, um, her advocacy and her last made me, um, I really like what you had to say, Rakasha, about um, the activist word. For some reason, ever since I started doing this work, it's always been on my mind a lot being labeled as an activist. And for me, it was more of just more of protecting my ways of life, protecting um, the future generations to come. It's all about the future generations and being able to keep living our ways of life without having to fear the dangers and the threats that come with it so um yeah um located close to us or uh people that are trying to make a change so native movement also uh was supportingly in this and they um I've been working really hard on the same issue. So the Butchin Steering Committee is what put together the Butchin Youth Council. Yes, so um, she's on this uh, Indigenous Women in Water and Governance um, episode. And each episode is actually around two hours because they're all uh, super, or all professionals, and they all have great knowledge um, and share their work on there. And so... Um, on this one, we have uh, uh, Tina uh, or Nitty, and then we have Erin Wise, um, who is uh, who was at Standing Rock, and she took care. She ba basically quit her job and took care of um, the youth at Standing Rock. Um, and so we all grew up she together. is she's super awesome. Majority Indigenous folks, Black folks. Um, I do believe that it's a continuation of the ongoing genocide that's been committed against people of the global majority here in the United States. Um, I feel like the lack of support that will likely um, not be there when it when it reaches First Nations, when it reaches, you know, communities in Canada, um, you know, that, that y'all will understand because it happens with everyone, no matter what side of the medicine line you're on, that we're the we're the disposable ones. Um, so. So really powerful conversations happened, and we're also able to have uh, and, um, and so so, uh, Tina Nata, who is a uh, Mari lawyer, and she's also an activist, and we are able to Google Maps. Um, we Google Maps everybody like where they're from, so everybody has an idea of where they're from in the world. Uh, so she's from New Zealand, and she's done amazing work herself. And so she's also um, in this highlight. And my bouts and name is Hikurangi. Uh, the tail that reaches up into the sky and um, and my um, river is Waiapu and my people are Ngātukurau. And I, where I live, yeah, is exactly where that dot is on the east. And so she actually developed, um, she shows this really powerful um, video which she also has done a virtual reality. And so that also can be found on here. Or oh, maybe we can go up. I am a Finua. I am Moana. Between my thighs is a liar. I have birthed lands and gods and generation of ancestors. I birth change. I birth grow.
between my guy is dick. I am the last whale before your longest night. I am the cold embrace. I am the fine and blue. I am female with my voice, the eye open channel beyond the veil. I welcome the unseen and shift the space between us. I am Hine. I pull the tides within you. I command sports. I bring war. I bring peace. I call the god. I bring their names. I fate you from these grace. The your book of men's rule, spade I cover. Well, just remember, your aging gray hairs came from a red. No, this. I was always here. These picking tongues erased my names even as they dictated their own demise. So don't you come along and think you save me. Recognize your life depends upon me. Understand your future lies within me. Realize that your ghost rests with me. I and she needed. Yeah, so she's done super cool work again. It's just a really created a really safe space and a real pow really powerful space and created a lot of relationships between uh different uh different people um from all over the really globally because because it was online, we were able to um have people from Alaska like Kwana from um, from the Amazon, from the Amazon conservation team, and from New Zealand, and also from Australia. So, and then also locally. So, all of these episodes can be found on Onegano's Let's Talk Water on all on YouTube. Um, it, and there are scientists on there. So, if you need any kind of paper, you can cite them for a paper. You can use them however you want. They're open to the public for schools. Um, for anybody to use. So, um, I don't want to take up too much time. So there's, there's a little bit about Oneganos Let's Talk Water. And it's just a really amazing thing that I, that I got to do. And I can't believe that we had, you know, over 30 episodes and each one's probably over two hours. So there's a lot of hours there. <laughs> And it was a lot of work, um, definitely, because we did one right after the other, and there was a lot of meetings prior, and we had to match up, you know, the scientists to the, um, to the indigenous uh, grassroots organizations, and so there was a lot of meeting be be behind the scenes, and trying to make it all work together and flow very well. So that was my job was to make sure everything flowed. Um, and so I was basically having a huge webinar every week and working on, working on that. So it was really, it was really, really intense, but it was a really great payoff. Um, I'm just happy that we were able to do it. But right now, um, Onega knows Let's Talk Water is actually, um, no longer going because we don't have any funding to continue. Um, we don't have a place to, that has Wi-Fi or a place to do um, to have a production like that. And so, um, so that's why I had to come to a stop, but all of those are still located on there. And if you want to know any more, any, 
any more about the Onegano's Water Research Project and about the different projects that are happening and going on, you can go to the Onegano's.com, Onegano's.com um, on our webpage. And all of those are there. And we also have tons of publications. And so you can cite um, the work too. Yeah. Thank you so much, Makasha. This is beautiful. And thank you so much for putting your your time, energy, and passion into sharing this with us as well. Um, if it's okay for the guests and then also for the audience, we'll go, uh, we'll spend another maybe 20 minutes to um, go through some of the questions that we had prepared for the guests. Um, and I wanted to start with the first question for, for any of you, Makasha, Anita, Priscilla, Haley, if you want to, to take that one, um, I wanted to ask, how do we change behavior towards actions that support protecting water for current, but also for future generations in your perspectives? Well, I'll take a shot at it. Um, could you say that one more time? Sure, it's it's a long question. I I understand. How do we change behavior towards actions that support protecting water for the current and future generations? Change behavior. Well, um, I think that we can start with just having indigenous um, education or just the real um, histories or treaties taught within our schools. Because it's not even in the uh, like basic Canadian cur curriculum. Um, so when people get to or when they find out things or they find out that, you know, uh, most reserves in Canada are water insecure. Or if they find out all of these or that they don't even know about the treaties that were made um, or whose land that they're on. You know, all of the they don't know that because it's nowhere. Uh, um, it's not said anywhere. And so I think that can definitely change behaviors towards indigenous peoples um, and like even change it within the workplace. And I think it has to be a systematic change in order for it to be super impactful. Um, but, you know, we can do work where we where we are and you can always vote and make changes and um, do what you can where you where you are right now if you're in school or whatever your job is um yeah I think change can happen thank you Makasha Heidi did you want to say something to that as well yeah I can add a little bit to that too so as my role as a policy analyst I think that it's really important um like the way that I view my work too and how we view Anishinaabe and Okanagawin um, in relation to Canadian law or Canadian policy. So anytime I review any sort of policy that's put out from the government, I don't technically care what the policy says in a sense, right? Like I do, but I don't. My role is to put mechanisms in place into their policies that support Anishinaabe and Okanagawin because it's a whole different set of systems. Um, and that's something that I think is really important in how I look at um, changing behavior from like a policy perspective because policy can be very like Western. Um, I think another aspect too, um, we just recently went to uh, Toronto about a month ago, and we went and presented Manitouaki and Okanagawin and the Nibet Declaration to uh, people, all of, uh, the ministry uh, representatives that we work with, um, the deputy ministers, and everybody, like all of uh, the public se the public sector uh, employees. And I think that that's a really big key aspect too, uh, mm -hmm. is sharing knowledge uh, with them. And to get them to understand too that it's two different, like two separate systems. And it's not about trying to incorporate Indigenous knowledge into Western systems or anything like that. It's about respecting uh, 
of the Anishinaabe and not going to for what it is. Um, and not we always, that's like the biggest thing. We're not incorporating, but respecting and coming together to harmonize the administration at the end so we can both respect, uh, protect the water and all uh, the natural resources, the animals, the skies, everything. Thank you, Haley. Uh, following on from that, um, in your in both of your experiences, how does the way that we treat water impact people's lives? I know that's a very general question. So, whatever inspires you right now. <laughs> how does the way we treat water impact people's lives? <laughs> Um, I think, I think that's the, that's the biggest, um, that's the biggest thing, right? Because when we, when, when, when Indigenous peoples think about water, you can think about a relation, relationship to the water and maybe not even separate yourself from the water. You're not separate from the water. You're the water, um, and the water is you. And if the water is not healthy, you're not healthy, or your people aren't healthy. And so, and water's inside us. Water is our first environment. Um, being in the womb, it's all of our first environment. And so, it's really, it's even in our creation stories, and it's in most indigenous people's creation stories. So, really, it's it's very valued and it's like seen as a as a grandmother that you value or a life giver that you know you can nobody can live without and so it's really it's a powerful thing it's a powerful uh feminine energy and and it needs to be respected and protected but for um like people like nestle they see water as a resource and and even if they um you know they see it as a resource and that's all that they see is is um is money signs and they don't see it as a living uh living thing they the c i think there's a ceo or this um the corporation a head president of the corporation said that water isn't a human right. So that's where you can see where their headspace is at, is that they don't even think that water is a human right. So it's totally at the end other end of that at the other end of the perspective uh, of the spectrum. So it's really, you know, what way over here and one way over here, we we're totally different. And so that I think that it's very alarming and it's scary. Um, but that's just the reality. Yeah, I think that you summed that up perfectly. That's exactly what I was thinking. And even just how, um, we respect women and how we respect water. I think that that's, you, you summed up everything that I was thinking. <laughs> that was beautifully said. Miigwech. It was. Thank you so much. And I, I wanted to add something quickly as well from a scientific perspective as well. I see water as something that connects us all, right? It flows through aquifers under our feet and then reaches people that don't even know each other on different sides of the continent, for example, or through the sky, right? There is essentially movements of water and, and rivers in the sky that essentially uh, connect us all uh, atmospherically as well. So whatever we do to a water in a certain place impacts people locally, but also on the global scale. Um, and it's something that fascinates me and that scares me at the same time because of the impacts that we're having to people from completely different generations and completely different environments as well. Um, if I can continue with another question, feel free to jump in if you want to say anything else, by the way. Uh, what is your hope going from, from that conversation for the future, for the health of water? Um, 
guys. <clears throat> for for us at Grand Council Treaty Three, I think that Priscilla and Nita said it perfectly too when they're talking about developing the Nibe curriculum and then also looking at uh, developing a Manitouki and Okanagan curriculum. I think that right now I'm really lucky. I work with lots of elders and knowledge keepers, um, but we're all not going to be here forever. So I think the more that we pass on that knowledge and keep passing on that knowledge and all of the teachings about water, I think that that's uh, my biggest my biggest hope is that we all just keep talking and learning, um, talking to each other. Because like you said, we all, and like Anita said too, we there's so many different principles around water all around the world. So I think the more that we come together to discuss it, um, even just the discussions themselves, like that's it's so powerful to plant those seeds in everybody else's mind as well. Um, and yeah, I think that that's what I see and also developing those protections, developing the Nibet Declaration into a law and um, Grand Council Treaty 3 and Treaty 3 as a whole, having being able to have the mechanisms in place uh, to enforce compliance around the Nibet Declaration and Manitouki and Okanagawin, um to make sure that um, it's protected and everybody knows how sacred it is for all generations. Um, I have a lot of hope. Um, my hope is that, well, it's been, uh, for our area that we have, um, I hope that the Nestle um, water bowling plants and the water is handed back to Six Nations and the land that they're on is handed back to Six Nations and that all the water extraction um, can stop and we can assert our sovereignty over our waters including our aquifers um but also including um our grand river system our river system and hopefully decommission some dams to help the river flow healthy again um and i hope that the indigenous our youth um are come back stronger and stronger and each generation gets stronger and um so that's all of my that's all of my hope and i think that we that those things aren't are i think that they are achievable and i don't think that they're impossible and so i have a lot of hope for future generations and that's all that we can hang on to in these scary times thank you so much i really hope as well that we can Stick a lot of these hopes that uh, you both mentioned. Thank you so much for uh, this wonderful discussion, and uh, also to Priscilla and Anita. Uh, and you know, it's just been uh, so fascinating to hear about the individual work that you're doing, work as a community, and your perspective. And uh, I really hope that we'll have many people able to uh, not only attend today, but listen to this talk after uh, and then continue to become part of this conversation and to understand um, all your perspectives. And uh, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, if you're okay, I'll think we can take a couple of questions from the audience here uh, before we before we go. Uh, the first one is just a comment from Kathleen Cameron just saying thank you so much and she is looking forward to seeing your presentations after. And uh, the next one is from Ashley Duffy and it says, um, non-Indigenous scientists have, have asked me if they can plug traditional knowledge into their computer model, but it's not that simple. These people have good intentions but don't know how to proceed. Um, how and what advice do you have for non-Indigenous scientists who want to decolonize their work in a good way? That's quite a tricky question. Uh, but um, and, and I don't know if Anita and Priscilla are able to to uh, answer as well. I'm not, I, I don't see their computer or their, their screen, but they may also still still be there as well. Um, so I, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that one first. Um, well, Oneganos is has all kinds of scientists, and it, um, and it is indigenous knowledge led in all the things that we carry out. And so it's, 
been challenging um, because, you know, there's those obstacles that they don't even know that they're, you know, having or that they're even going through, but they're, they have to like, just basically relearn, relearn and know that like indigenous knowledge is just as valuable as a PhD or even more than a PhD. So it's just valuing indigenous knowledge, but also um, it's really tricky, like how you go about it. And I think that all indigenous communities are different because some somebody's in Alaska, it's going to be different how you carry out research from uh, woodland territory and uh, all communities are different. Some are matrilineal, some are, uh, uh, pay, 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 I don't know. I can't remember. Patriarchal. Yeah, patriarchal. <laughs> all, all indigenous communities are so different and that's, it's, they make, that's what makes them beautiful, but it's just, each one's different. And I think that, um, yeah, there's definitely resources out there, like, um, how to carry out ethics and whatnot, but we have uh, the publications for Oneganos too, and I think that will really help. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that too, and I think it depends what the researcher's relationship is um, to um, the elder knowledge keeper um, who's providing the knowledge. I think that's key because I think that the knowledge keeper would be able to um, say yes if they're comfortable or not. It depends where the research is coming. I think that it, to me, anyways, it all goes back to that relationship. Um, what kind of consent is being given, where you're getting the in, the information from. Um, yeah, it's kind of multifaceted, but I would say my from my perspective, it depends on your relationship and then following any sort of um data principles and guidelines that apply to that community or the nation as a whole those are such good points and i do agree that um you know we, the place matters a lot and also the the research and the resources that um, you're able to share because i think a lot of people are going to learn from uh over over time and also learning from the nabi declaration and the process you're going through Haley and the Treaty 3, I think there's a lot to be learned there, as you say, respecting things in their own right uh, for, for what they are and, uh, and, and you know, uh, learning and, uh, and growing as researchers, uh, respecting that knowledge as being separate and unique in and of itself. And I think uh, we may have one more question here. Oh, no, there, there. if anyone has any other questions, just please let us know. Um, there was just a thank you there, uh, saying that it's uh, very helpful. And I think it's, um, uh, unfortunately, I can see that Anita and Priscilla are disconnected. So I think um, we will uh, end, end the discussion here. And um, this will be the end of the formal webinar with the closed captioning and French interpretation. Uh, and we, the young professionals are welcome to stay on for a few minutes afterwards and ask our guests uh, any questions you might have about your career development um uh, and uh but i'll just you know take a couple of seconds to to close this out it is our last lecture of the 2023 women plus water uh, lecture series and um it's yeah so hard to believe it's it's you say we've had 30 episodes of one again so now we, we've had the this and it's now now done for the season and we just want to thank so much global water futures and the global water futures and professionals that are here today and the global institute for water security uh, for committing their resources to make this uh, series a reality, and especially to the virtual audience that joins each week and participates. We know that we have had people from over 60 countries uh, participating in Women Plus Water, and it's great to know that these conversations um, are being shared around the world. And this is really contributing to a conversation of people um, learning ways of thinking and knowing that they may not have known before. Um, and if you have enjoyed the series and would like to consider becoming a sponsor or a partner, please let us know, uh, as we're always looking for ways to continue to grow with the Women Plus Water community, the lecture series, the expert list, mentorship opportunities, and more. And we love any suggestions that folks might have about also how we can do that. <laughs> and and um, we will make the recording of today's event and all of the other past events available on our website, www.womenpluswater.org. 
And uh, I'd just like to close this out with a special thank you to Dr. Cora Schuster Wallace for providing the leadership uh, to develop Women Plus Water as a lecture series. To uh, our colleague Stacey Donatsky for everything that she does in communications and outreach to make this series possible all year long. To Sean Ahmed, who is leading the live stream of today's event and all Women Plus Water events. Uh, that makes this possible to a whole other audience uh, that um, joins through the LinkedIn platform. And Fred Ryden for leading the branding and marketing and helping us to really think about our vision, about why we're doing this and uh, and how to build the community. And Jesse Widow, who has supported us to develop the Women Plus Water Expert List. And if you're not already on the Women Plus Water Expert List, uh, We'd love to have you join and to uh, be there to continue to find more ways to share your knowledge with uh, other folks around, around the world. So thank you so much.